Well, good morning. How are you guys today? Man, it's so great to be with y'all, and I'm so excited that you're here, and I just know how much you love Jesus because it is a beautiful day out, and you chose to come hang out with us, and we just want to say thank you. If you're a guest, thank you for being here today. Um, If there's anything we can do to serve you, let us know, and then seat in front of you, there's a little connect card. Uh, If you would just, after service, take that into our VIP room, we'd love a chance to meet you, connect with you, and just get a chance to uh, say hi to you. We have a gift for you, and we want to say thank you so much for being here. How many of of you have enjoyed this series that we've been walking through called The Thread. 19 weeks uh, throughout the world. It has been great. And um, yes, and man, if you have not uh, seen all or been a part of all of our services, I want to encourage you to go back, catch up. It's been wonderful. This week we are continuing uh, in the series and Pastor started last week talking about this big transition in the nation of Israel. And, and uh, Pastor is on a well-deserved break today, and he left me with the hardest of the two nations. So I want to say thank you, Pastor, uh, on, that, on that trip. But he sp- uh, last week, he talked about Israel splitting from one unified nation. There was three kings uh, that had uh, ruled over the nation of Israel. There was Saul, then there was David, and then there was Saul. And they were unified as a nation. And at the end of Solomon's life, uh, as he dies, uh, things changed drastically. And Pastor last week talked about the southern kingdom of Judah, which was now named Judah. And the northern kingdom with 10 tribes uh, was um, Israel. That's what I was thinking of. That was great. Israel. And... And this is where my brain kind of goes because uh, as we talk today about the northern kingdom of Israel, I just wanted to let you know up front, there is nothing good that happens over the next 200 years in the north. And my brain was thinking, it's kind of like that team up north. There is nothing good that happens up there. And so I thought, how do I fit that in? And all of a sudden I forgot Israel. So... So just if you're wondering today out of the southern kingdom of Judah and the tribe of Judah, and eventually we know that Jesus comes out of that tribe of Judah, uh, and they had a slow burn and crash, but man, Israel, it was just destruction from day one. So if you're here and you don't know a lot about the Bible, just remember the team up north, nothing good came out of its leadership. Got it? Amen? We can pray now. Let's go home and uh, celebrate. And so we have these two nations that now that are uh, coming into their infancy. And the southern kingdom starts off with terrible leadership decisions by a man named Rehoboam. He is Solomon's son, and his very first decision transforms everything. If you remember last week, Pastor talked about that the people came to Rehoboam and said, man, if you would just lighten up on us, they had been taxed heavily. They had been going through a lot of political turmoil. They were, uh, they were being ruled over by his father uh, with, a really, with a real iron fist. And they said, if you would just lighten up a little bit and you would ease up on the taxes. Does that sound familiar still? Amen? Man, I feel like we're connecting already here. And uh, if you would just ease up on the taxes, if you would just lighten up, we will serve you. And remember Rehoboam, his first big leadership decision was, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be worse than my dad. That caused these t- the 10 northern tribes to flee and say, we're going to go find our own king. And that's where we're going to be at today. Israel and all of this, their whole heart is they want a king. They want a king and God has been telling them, you don't need a king. They want a king because all the other nations around them have a king. They look and man, it just seems great to have a king. And what they were really saying is, man, we want someone who will be our protector and our provider and our sustainer. And all along, God is going, that is what I have been to you. I have been your protector. I have been your deliverer. I have been your provider. And they are wanting a king, and God says, okay, I know you're going to want a king, but here's the deal. Let me choose your king. And the first thing that the southern, or the northern kingdom does, the, of Israel does, is they say, no, we want to choose our own king. And they choose a man named Jeroboam. Jeroboam is, he had been under Solomon, uh, is uh, kind of like leading a lot of his military efforts. And they choose this man. He is wise, they think. They think he's a great leader. But really, he had led a rebellion against the house of David. And so now we're at this place where they want a king, but ultimately, they're ignoring God. And I don't think it was so much that they just 
wanted a king, I think it's that they wanted to be their own king. I think in a lot of ways they wanted to be in control of everything in our life. And there's so many parallels between us today and what was happening uh, back in the, in the biblical times. They still wanted to be in charge. They, they wanted to have control. You said, uh, a French philosopher once said, in the beginning God created man in his own image. And from that moment, men has been trying to repay the favor. That we have been trying to create God in our own image. And that's ultimately what's happening in this moment. And so Jeroboam is now the king. He is, he is set up to be the king. And he will do the very same thing that Rehoboam does. He is going to make a horrible leadership decision. Now I'm just going to tell you that over 210 years, the nation of Israel uh, lasts. There's not one redeeming king in all of this. There was 19 kings and every one of them, as you will see, got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. So the first bad king is as good as it gets for 210 years. And all along the way, God is still, he's still giving opportunity for the Northern Kingdom to redeem themselves. But they choose to continue to follow their own path. And here's what I want us to know in all this as we start today and we kind of get into this. No matter where you are, no matter what your story is, no matter how life may seem that it just seems to go from worse to worse to worse or bad decision, bad decision, bad decision, wherever you find yourself, it's not too late for a new beginning until it is too late for a new beginning. God had warned them and warned them and warned them. And next week we'll talk about the exile. They lose their nation. We always say that those words, um, it's never too late. How many know that's just not true? There will be a day, it will be too late. It'll be too late for a new start, a new beginning. It'll be too late to say you're sorry, to repair a relationship. It is, it is not too late today, but there will be a day, it will be too late. And for our own lives, there will be a, a time for all of us that it will be too late to reconcile our hearts with God. But all along the way, God keeps calling us, come now, come now, come now. And Israel misses it every single time. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Kings. We're going to be there uh, for quite a bit today. And I want to just share a few thoughts as we walk along the, the life of Jeroboam and the kings of Israel. The first thought I have, and I think it's so important, is this, is that we cannot build the future that God wants for us or that we desire for our life on a faulty foundation. The foundation is everything. The foundation is what you build your life on. The foundation is what you build anything on. And here's the thing about a foundation. You can build a foundation that is very poor and build a house that looks really pretty for a while, but eventually it will crumble. And we're going to see in this moment how Israel now builds their whole foundation in a, on a faulty system and a faulty process. They start off wrong. And so Jeroboam is now, he's been, uh, he's been voted in as king. He is, he's set up. He knows that, that God's hand is upon him because here's what God even says. He says, Jeroboam, if you will obey me, you will do what I've called you to do. You will trust me, a man of the law. You will, you will honor me. I will make you great and bless you. I will give you a, a dynasty equal to that of David. How many think that's a good promise? I will make your family as great as the greatest king who ever lived. All you have to do is follow me. And so we pick it up in this first big moment of 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 26. Jeroboam thought to himself, how many know sometimes that can be the worst thing when you sit and you think to yourself, guys, I'm never at my best when I'm thinking by myself. He thought to himself, after God just says, I'm going to bless you and be with you, the kingdom will likely revert to the, back to the house of David. If the people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to the Lord. Rehoboam, king of Judah, they will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. Let me kind of just bring all of this of what is happening in this moment. See, we have these 12 tribes. The 12 tribes were the 12 sons of, of Jacob. Jacob is later named Israel. The 12 sons had different territories in the land. 
When, when, when the three kings that have lasted 120 years, they are all pursuing the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are faithful. They love God. When the kingdom splits, what now happens is the people that were in the, the northern kingdom that team up north, they would go down to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was in, Ju- uh, was in Judah. And they would still celebrate the rituals. They would go to the festivals. They were still going back to Jerusalem. And this first moment of leadership that Jeroboam does is he starts to think in his mind, something is going to be taken from me. He stops thinking like a king. He stops thinking like a man of God. And he starts making decisions based on selfish motive. And I know we probably are never going to have to have the weight of deciding about the kingdom that we're going to run and what we'll do with it. But all of us are going to have to make a decision on this journey. Am I going to make decisions in my life based on selfish motive and fear or am I going to trust God? Jeroboam ignored the Lord and he sought to control himself, his nation, and even his God. Panic now stricken. And so here's what he does. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. See, that's something only a guy would come up with. Isn't it? I'm going to sit and think to myself, how can I now get everyone back? I'll make something. And so he gets to this place where he makes two golden calves. Now, what's significant in this moment? Do you remember when they were, God delivers them out of Egypt? And he, uh, Moses goes up to the mountain to talk to God, to get the law. And while he's gone, they start creating their own God. And what do they create? A golden calf. And what he's saying is, do you remember back uh, when God was really God, when, when Moses was out of the picture, this is what our forefathers really wanted to worship. He's doing everything he can to get the allegiance to him because at the heart of these, these 12 or 10 tribes that are of the northern kingdom, they still in their mind are people that want to pursue God. And so he tries to strip God from their hearts and he says, here are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan, meaning the north and the south of the territory. And this thing became sin. The people came to worship at the uh, one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. What Jeroboam does in his first leadership decision is he lays a foundation that will destroy the future of what God wanted to do in his life. Instead of trusting that, that God would be with him, He not only tries to manipulate the people, but he tries to manipulate God. And so he he creates these golden calves and he says, go worship them. And then he would put temples around these golden calves so people would now go and worship there and they would sacrifice there. Not only that, he changes the dates of the festivals and he confuses the people so they don't even know when when the festivals are of, of God. So they don't go to Jerusalem anymore. And it was all because of this. He didn't want to lose what he had. He brought curse upon the generations that would follow because he refused to follow God. And so he ignores everything that God had promised him. See, the foundations we lay in our lives, they will ultimately affect the next generation. How many can look back in your own family and you can see decisions that maybe your mom or your dad had made and that their parents made and their parents made that affect you today, good or bad? What one generation does, the next generation is going to take and do in excess. And here we find Jeroboam and he makes this one decision that transforms everything. And so Jeroboam is the king and now he dies. And listen to what it says in 1 Kings 15, 25. Nadab, son of Jeroboam, now his son, became king of Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel for two years. Verse 26. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the ways of his father and committing the same sin his father had caused Israel to commit. I want you to see that last sentence of that because that is going to be the pattern for 19 kings. They get to this place where they're, they're just continuing to follow in the destruction of what Jeroboam lays out. 
It goes on to say in verse 34, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the ways of Jeroboam, committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit. The foundation has been laid. And then the foundation that he lays, here's ultimately what he is doing. He is ultimately pulling the nation and the people away from the things of God. But what's so profound in all these kings that we will see is that they are all the, gener- they are all the genealogy of Jeroboam. His son and his grandson, his great-grandson, they have all, they have all left their faith. They have all made horrible decisions and it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse. Because the foundation that is laid in our lives will ultimately be what we build upon it. And what, what we need to realize, listen to me, dads especially, listen to me. When I had my four kids, I thought at first I needed to be a perfect dad. And my wife reminded me really quickly, well, that ain't happening. (laughs) And what I've learned over the last 21 years of being a dad is this, is that my kids didn't need to see me be perfect. They needed to see the foundation of where I would return when things got bad. That Jesus was always going to be the place that I would return And from king to king to king, at any point, any king could have said, let's stop, let's let's lay a new foundation, but they don't, they just keep going because they're repeating what they saw. Listen to how it goes from here. And so this is as good as it gets because it now even gets worse. So Zimri, 1 Kings 16, 12, destroyed the whole family of Basha in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken against Basha through the prophet Jehu. Because of all the sins Basha and his son Elah had committed and had caused Israel to commit, they aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, by their worthless idols. I think it is so important for us to pause and look at this going, the foundation of my life will ultimately be the product of my legacy. That is the God, the foundation of my life, is my own agenda, the foundation of my life. And let me just say it like this. We can even build foundations that seem spiritual, but are not about Jesus. And we can build pretty things on them in our lives. And we can make it sound Christian and look Christian. But no matter how great everything looks on the outside, if the foundation is not solid. If the foundation is on things that will last in God, it will ultimately crumble. And and Israel is now just continuing to build a foundation that is gonna ultimately bring destruction. 1 Kings 16, 25. But Ormai did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all of those before him. How would you like to have that as your title in the scriptures? He was worse than everyone else that came before him. It says that he followed completely the ways of Jeroboam. There it is again. It all goes back to the foundation, son of Nabak, committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit so that they aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, by their worthless, these worthless idols. See, in this place, in this space, they keep trying to pursue things that don't matter. And for us, our foundation, it can talk, we can talk how our, our, what we're building and what we're doing, but if the foundation of our life and our heart is not built on the things of God, it will all be worthless. It will be meaningless. And if it doesn't get bad enough here, it now just gets a little bit worse. 1 Kings 16.30. Ahab, the son of Omri did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. So that means grandparents, your grandkids are not as great as you think they are. (laughs) He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, here's what he was saying, you think think that sin's bad of, of idolatry and destruction? Man, I'm gonna make it even worse. I will outdo my grandfather, my great grandfather, my great great grandfather. Watch what I do here, that was trivial. It says, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he had built in Samaria. Ahab had also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all of the king of Israel before him. I want you to see this. 
This is now the, the, the ultimate moment. We'll talk about the prophets in the coming weeks when uh, Elijah and Elisha, and we hear about the battle with the prophets of Baal. This is the actually what brings ultimate destruction among hundreds of thousands of people. They're worshiping a false god. They're pursuing things that are false. And now the, it, it all begins because one guy says, I'm not going to serve God, and I'm not going to obey God, and I'm not going to trust God that he would do what he said he would do. That now generations later, destruction continues. And here's what I know about all of these kings. None of them could have changed what their fathers did, but all of them could have changed what their sons saw. None of them could have changed the past. Do you know we cannot change our past? We cannot change what our parents did to us or didn't do for us. We can't change our mistakes and our sins. We cannot change anything that happened up to this moment. But we have to realize we can change our future. We can change what happens tomorrow. But most of us, we live in what was that we fail to see what could become and what God promises he would do in our life. We, we think, man, maybe God wouldn't accept me or, man, if, man, there's no way that God would love me because look at this past or, or my family's past. There's no way that God would love me. But it's amazing that through every king, God is still paying attention, hoping and pleading that they would come back to him. And when they don't, it just breaks his heart even more and more and more. It wasn't that God was angry that they were just sinning. It brought God to anger because it was destroying the people that he loved. Our lives, our sin, our issues, they're never just our sin, our life, and our issues. How many know your sin, my sin, our sin always affects others? And it will affect from generation to generation to generation. And, and if we do not stop and inspect the foundation of our life, we will build something that may seem good for a while, but it will ultimately bring destruction. When's the last time you looked at the foundation of your life? Is it centered around God and the things of God? Tiffany and I lived in uh, Texas for a few years, and I remember our first year there was in the summer. We had 65 days of 110 plus uh, temperatures, no rain. And people go, but it's a dry heat. Just stick your head in an oven and see if it feels any better. <laughs> One day we get a knock on the door, and it's the fire department. And they asked me a question an Ohio boy has never been asked. Sir, have you watered your foundation? I'm not even sure what that means. It doesn't even sound like it's a clean joke. I don't even know what any of this means. He said, have you watered your foundation? I go, no. He said, have you, have you looked at it? And, no. He said, in Texas, we have to go around and have people inspect their foundation. He said, let me show you. And he walked me through and all of the, the dirt had been gotten so hard and dry, it pulled away from the house, the foundation. And the foundation was cracking all around. It was ironic because we were putting in new kitchen stuff, like redoing the kitchen at that very time. And I thought, foundations are so boring. <laughs> Nobody says, come over and look at my foundation. But everybody sees when your foundation isn't right, eventually it falls apart. So the first thing I did was I watered my foundation, as goofy as that sounds. But I had to inspect the foundation because no matter what I did on top of the foundation, eventually it was all going to bring destruction. And for us spiritually, if we do not inspect the foundation, what is the foundation, the core of our life? Is it built on the promises of God, the things of God? Or is it, is it built on the things of our own desires and our own wants and our own heart? We have to do an inspection, and this is to believers. This is to believers. How is the foundation of your marriage? How is the foundation of your faith? How is the foundation of our church? 
Because we can't continue to build the future that God wants for you and us if we have a faulty foundation. See, God will let us have the desires of our heart for a while, if they're, even if they're not from him. And he will let us have things that will ultimately bring destruction so we can see what truly matters. And Israel misses it for 210 years. And why? Because on one day, one king built on a bad foundation. Instead of building on God, he built on selfish motive. Jesus said it about the foundation best in Matthew 7, 24. He said, everyone that, who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat the house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, they are a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Here's the thing. You can still build a nice house on the sand for a season. And the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat against the house and it fell. And great was its fall. You know, I was thinking back over these last couple years and when, when COVID hit, not all the uh, middle of COVID chaos, but do you remember the very first day like COVID really hit and you were like shut down and you're with your family and you're going, how am I going to get through this? I can't go eat. I can't do nothing. I'm stuck with these kids in homeschooling. <laughs> what am I going to do? And it felt so weird and it was so disconnected. And, and everyone was in turmoil. And now when we look back, we don't think about that season. Of, we think about all the chaos that came after. Right? We forget how much God has brought us through. Newsweek put a report out that the church is on the brink of destruction in America. And I want you to know that's just not true. I'm looking at living proof at CLC that God is doing great things. Man, our church is growing, it is healthy. Every week people are getting saved. Come on, that's a good thing to clap for. This church is, was built by our pastor and our, our leaders on a healthy foundation. We didn't slow down, we ramped up. But there were churches, even then, they had forgot what God had done and they gave up, man. They stopped worrying about reaching people and preserving themselves. And one in five churches closed in America. And when we look now at what God is doing, the question is this, is not so much what are we building, but what are we building on? Are we building on Jesus? The second thought I had when I was walking through the Kings was this, is that ultimately your King will determine your destiny. Your King will determine your destiny. Let me just say it like this, everybody in here has a King. You have, you are following someone in your life. You're either, maybe you're the King of your own uh, life and your own world. I'm the only thing I'm the King of is my recliner if my wife's not sitting in it. Maybe your king is money. Maybe your king is your position. Maybe your king. But everyone has a king. The question is, who is the king of your life? Because who you follow will ultimately be where you end up. Your king is going to determine your destiny. And many times we look at our life and we go, how did I get here? How did it end up like this? No one got to where you are by accident. Come on. Right, there is, we are all following and pursuing something. Maybe it's we're following ourselves. And by the way, I did that for 18 years of my life until I found Jesus. And what I learned was I was a bad king and a bad God of my own life. Some of us are pursuing other people. We're, we're, man, we don't even care about leadership anymore. We use the word influencer. Have you noticed that? I'm an influencer. And here's the truth. We are all influencers. But we are all easily influenced. And king after king after king, they kept following destruction. 
And instead of pausing and putting yourself under a new kingdom, they kept moving towards destruction. And when we get our eyes off of God, when we get our eyes off the thing God calls us to, we will ultimately follow something and somewhere. John 5, 19, Jesus said this, truly I say to you, the son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees his father doing. And whatever the father does, the son does likewise. And for some of you, maybe you didn't have great examples to follow. Maybe you didn't have a great role model. You didn't have a great dad or a leader to follow in your life. For some of us, maybe we just pursued our own things and forgot about what we had seen. But here's what I want you to know. Where you fix your eyes on and who you fix your eyes on will ultimately be where you end up. It will be where you end up. And the third and last thought I had as I was reading through these kings was this, is that recovery in our life begins with a new foundation. Some of us, we worry about just changing the building on the foundation. But I want you to know, if we are going to recover from the hurts and the brokenness of our life, we've got to build a new foundation. And as generation after generation for 210 years in the Northern Kingdom, at any point, any king could have said, stop. We're going to lay a new foundation. We're going to go back to the promises of God. And no one had the courage or the faith to stop and go, today I'm building a new foundation. Doing everything you've always done is never gonna give you a different result. And for some of us, maybe we're here today, and man, we have been, uh, we're going, how did I get here? It just seems like it went from bad to worse, to worse, to worse. My marriage, how did it get here? My family, my faith, my brokenness. And here's what I want you to know. No matter where you are on the journey, God wants to step in and lay a new foundation. But you can paint an ho old house so many times and it still doesn't change the foundation. And the reason Israel where is where it was is because Sin pulled them away from God. And here's the thing, there is no difference between them and us. We've all sinned and fallen short. Yeah, but you, could, but you don't even know how bad my sin is. No, but I'll bet you Ahab beat it. That no matter where you are, how bad it is, God is inviting you and calling you and telling you, just like he told Job, I will bless you. I will give you eternal life. I will forgive you. Just come back to me. It's not too late. And if you think, well, if I just find God or I find church, that'll fix it. No, that might be a, that might be a building component. But the foundation of our life has to be surrendered to King Jesus. Look forward to Jesus. Keep moving towards Jesus. See, it's not too late to build a new future. But it always begins, listen to me, with me and not them. You can't change what happened to you. You can't change what is going on in the world around us. A foundation begins with a heart change in me. It begins right here, in this space, in this place. And it wasn't just that Jeroboam makes a bad decision and it goes on. It was that every son that followed blamed the dad before them. At some point, I've got to realize if I'm going to see the future that I want, the foundation has to be different. It has to change. Ephesians 4.22 says like this, to put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. 
and to be renewed by the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness, meaning this, I've got to now say, here is the foundation I will build my life on. That God is wanting to bring recovery in all of our lives. One thing I'm so proud of CLC is that you guys know, uh, beginning of this year, we started a, a new ministry called Celebrate Recovery here at, at CLC. And um, how many, has anybody been to, to CR? Okay, that's your cue. Every time I say CR, you're just clapping. That was amazing. Okay, got it. Man, we have, seen, we have seen hundreds of people come through, but we're hearing every week life change stories. Pastor Stan and I got a stack of cards this thick of saying what CR had meant and changed their life, but ultimately it was about this. It was about Jesus stepping in and laying a new foundation and putting him on a different road, a different path. CR isn't like a drug and alcohol recovery. It's, it's called a life recovery. If you have a hurt, a habit, or a hang up, it's recovery saying, I want a new foundation. I don't want to just keep doing what has always been done. I want something new. I think it's one of the greatest things we do here at CLC. Matter of fact, I want you to watch this really quick video of one of our leaders, Jamie, from a CR. First, for two reasons. One, if you're here today, I want you to know you haven't gone too far for God to give you a new foundation. And number two, I want us to see and know what we're praying and investing in as a church, as God's changing lives in our city. Hi, my name's Jamie Thompson, um, and this is a little bit of my story of recovery. So looking back, I believe I had struggled with unresolved problems stemming from my lack of relationship with my dad. Um, he was physically there, but he was emotionally and mentally abusive to myself, my brother, and my mom. Um, he never really paid me any attention, so I struggled with feeling less than, I struggled with feeling wanted. Um, and that greatly affected me growing up and, and as a teen. Um, I started seeking out relationships at a young age and then um, in my early teens, I experimented with drugs and alcohol. I found something was better than nothing and it helped me to cope and it helped me to feel um, like I wasn't so empty. Unfortunately, it didn't take away the pain, um, so I continued to seek out for whatever would, would help with that. I got pregnant at 16 and became a mom at 17. Um, for a little bit of time, things got better, um, but I felt like I was missing out on a life that my friends had, so it was back to partying with me. Um, I knew the Lord because growing up my mom had taken my brother and I to church, but as soon as I um, could, I left the church right after I had my son. When my boys were still very young, um, their dad left, so I was left to raise a three-year-old and a newborn all by myself. I was tired, I was stressed, I was frustrated, and I felt alone. So I did anything and everything I could to escape those feelings. Pills, alcohol, whatever it could be. The worst part for me was when I was diagnosed with cancer at 23. Um, I began taking so much medication that my prescription had ran out. My parents had taken my boys because I was in no shape to have them. Um, I was sad, I was lonely, I was depressed. I gave up and decided to try the ultimate evil and that was heroin. After I was de denied my medications, I hit rock bottom and everything just unfolded from there. I lost my home that was in a nice neighborhood um, because I wasn't paying the bills, I wasn't paying the utilities, and I ended up on the wrong side of Middletown in a really rundown house. Some days I didn't eat. Um, it was the drugs or food and water, and I chose the drugs. Um, I remember vividly having a conversation with my mom and telling her that I didn't believe that I would live to be 30. I was afraid that I would use one night and never wake up. Um, but my mom was a praying mama and she continued to pray for me um, regardless. So I told her that I wanted to get help and she said, okay. My parents gave me the opportunity to come back to their home as long as I um, decided to get help which I did, and I immediately started going to meetings and working with a sponsor um, and trying to just rebuild my life and my boy's life one step at a time. I did better, but I still felt like something was missing, um, and I realized that that was, that was the Lord, that I needed that relationship. So I got on my hands and my knees, and I cried out to Him. 
I couldn't tell you the day or the time that that happened, but I know that he met me there. And at that moment, I knew that my life was going to get better, and he started beginning. He began to pick up the pieces of my life. Um, that was 10 years ago. Not every day is great, and not every day is easy, but I'm grateful for the second chance. I'm grateful for the beautiful life that I have today, and I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to help others that are struggling just like I was. Um, God is faithful, God is good, and you know, He turned my mess into my message, and my test into my testimony. And if He can do it for me, and He can change my heart, then He can do it for anybody. Come on, how good was that? Come on, can we stand this morning? I'm going to pray with you. By the way, before we pray, um, yeah, let's just stand all over there and we can. Before we pray, I just, I want to invite all of you, I'd love for you to come and, and just be a part of our Celebrate Recovery on Monday nights at, at uh, 6 o'clock. And man, maybe you know someone who's hurting or going through some brokenness. You can uh, click this QR code there and you can get the information. You can send them an invite. Um, maybe you are looking for some help for a new foundation. I promise you, it's a great way to start. Or maybe you're going, man, I'd love to be a part and just serve in there. We need some people to join Jamie and worship because man, we've got... We got this biker club coming this Monday and man, we're gonna be worshiping there. We need people on our worship team. We need people to help in our children. If you have uh, special like education skills to work with young children, we need you because when parents are going through recovery, kids are going through recovery, we've got kids that are there. Or man, maybe you know some, some leaders that in the community that uh, have a real gifting or um, an education to help with mental illness and stuff, that would be, would you just send them our way? Because we believe God is about to do some amazing things. But it's not about Celebrate Recovery. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And what I loved about Jamie's story was this. It didn't seem like it was getting better. When the road leads to heroin, there are a lot of steps there. It seems like it's not getting better. And here's what I want you to know. You can't repair the house until you lay the right foundation. And man, she laid that foundation saying yes to Jesus. She's one of our best leaders, phenomenal worship leader. But here, this is really about us. How's your foundation? First, I would just ask you, do you know Jesus? Is he the Lord of your life? Have you confessed who you are and who he is, that I'm a sinner and he's my savior? Because no matter what you do, if that foundation isn't right, you will never find the future that you've been looking for. For us here at CLC, I wonder, how's the foundation of your marriage, your children, your life, is there some repairs in the foundation that you need to brush up on? Because man, life has been taking a toll. Here's what I know, whatever we build upon, it's all about Jesus. And when we build on him, he changes our life. And so I just wanna encourage you, if there's cracks in your foundation, Today's the day to just say, Lord, I'm giving these to you. I'm asking you to repair these cracks and draw me closer to you. With every eye closed and every head bowed, if you join us online in prayer as well. As I pray today, I'm gonna pray for the, those that wanna say yes to Jesus. To say, I want Jesus to be the king of my life. And when I pray today, if you say, man, that's where I'm at, and would you include me in that prayer? If you would, with no one look, would you just lift your hand up and say, hey, Shin, would you pray with me as well? Because I want, I want to surrender my life to Jesus today. Right now, just raise your hand all over. Let me see. Yes, sir. I don't want to miss anybody here. Hold it up. I just don't want to miss anybody. Yes, ma'am. Anybody over here? I don't want to just pray with you. I see you, buddy. Awesome. Yes, sir. 
For the rest of us that maybe we have a relationship with Jesus would say, man, I've got some cracks in the foundation. There's some areas not submitted or need repaired. And if today you would say, man, I, I just want to surrender those to Jesus. Maybe it's your marriage, your family, it's your, whatever it is, you would say, pray with me. If that's you, just lift your hands right now. All over this room, yes. We're going to pray this prayer together for those of you that said yes. Um, we're going to pray this prayer to Jesus and everyone who's a believer is going to pray along with you. But here's how easy it is. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he is faithful to give you a new life that will last for all of eternity. Let's all pray this together. Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I've missed it. But I'm asking you to come into my life today to forgive me of my past and to be the king of my life. I surrender my life to you. Thank you that you're a God of second chances. Thank you that you never give up on us. And thank you for loving us right where we are. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, come on, let's give God a great big hand today. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for being here today. If you're a guest, we'd love to meet you in our VIP room. And if you said yes to Jesus, if you would take one of those connect cards in the seat and uh, bring it to the VIP room, we, we would love to walk with you. We want to celebrate with you because we believe you made the greatest decision of your life. Guys, have a great day. God bless you. Thank you so much.